we have finally arrived at episode 10, which is going to be the final episode of the series of Navigating Linear Algebra. But before we get too emotional, certainly we should do some Linear Algebra first. So the protagonist of this episode is going to be the Jordan normal form. But before we get to know Jordan, we are first going to talk about properties of a linear map phi from v to v, where dimension of v here is going to be set to n, such that phi here is actually nilpotent. And what I mean by nilpotent, if you remember, is that for any vector v in this capital V, if we start with v and we apply phi to it enough times, so we do phi v, then phi phi v, and so on, then eventually, eventually there is going to come to a point where this thing is going to be zero. We have seen many examples of nilpotent matrices up to this episode. Anyway, going back to phi, what we are going to consider is we're going to consider a chain which is going to consist of kernel of phi to the fourth quotiented out by kernel of phi cubed. Remember that we talked about quotient space in episode 6. And to the left, we are going to have kernel of phi to the fifth modded out by kernel of phi to the fourth, then kernel of phi to the sixth modded out by kernel of phi to the fifth, and so on. So we actually have an infinite chain here to the left. And then we have kernel of phi cubed modded out by kernel of phi squared, kernel of phi squared modded out by kernel of phi, and finally we can just have kernel of phi. And now let us consider some linearly independent vectors in say this quotient space. So let's say we have some v1, v2, v3 mod kernel of phi cubed that's linearly independent in this quotient space which is telling us since v1, v2, v3 is going to be in kernel of phi to the fourth that's telling us that when we apply phi to them, so when we have phi v1, phi v2, and phi v3, and we take mod kernel of phi squared, then these should be in this quotient space. And now, of course, a natural question that arises is whether this thing is also linearly independent. And I claim that the answer is yes. How do we check this? Well, let's say we have a linear combination. So let's say we have a1, phi v1, plus a2, phi v2, plus a3, phi v3 such that it's equal to 0 mod kernel of phi squared. What is this telling us? Well, this thing is really phi of a1 v1 plus a2 v2 plus a3 v3. And since this thing was 0 mod kernel of phi squared, we know this entire thing is in kernel of phi squared, which is telling us that this part, a1 v1 plus a2 v2 plus a3 v3, this part is going to be 0 mod kernel of phi cubed, just because when we apply phi to it, and we apply phi two more times, we are going to get a zero. And since v1, v2, v3 were linearly independent mod kernel of phi cubed, that's telling us that a1, a2, a3 are going to be zeros, which means we have this linear independence as well. And what this is telling us is that if v1, v2, v3 mod kernel of phi cubed were a basis, so if we had a basis here, then 5v1, 5v2, and 5v3 mod kernel of phi squared are linearly independent. In other words, the dimension of kernel of phi cubed modded up by kernel of phi squared cannot be smaller than dimension of kernel of phi to the fourth modded up by kernel of phi cubed. So this is actually telling us an astonishing fact that as you go towards the right, the dimension is never going to decrease. So the dimension only increases or is going to stay the same. Now, something to realize here is that the dimension of kernel of phi squared modded up by kernel of phi is of course dimension of kernel of phi squared minus dimension of kernel of phi. And here, the dimension of this quotient space of course is dimension of kernel of phi cubed minus dimension of kernel of phi squared. So something that you may notice is that if we add up the dimension of these three spaces, then we are going to get dimension of kernel of phi cubed because these dimensions are going to cancel out. And of course, we can continue that process. If we add up the dimensions of these four spaces, we are going to get the dimension of kernel of phi to the fourth, and so on. And that's telling us that if we add up the dimensions of all of these spaces, so starting with kernel of phi, then dimension of this thing, then dimension of this thing, and so on, and we add them up, then the sum is going to be n most n. And that's because the dimension of kernel of phi cubed is going to be n most n, dimension of kernel of phi to the fourth is going to be n most n, and so on. And now this is something I'll ask you to think about. The dimension cannot be strictly less than n because phi is nilpotent. Every vector is going to disappear when we apply phi to it enough times. So when we sum up the dimensions here, we should in fact get exactly n. Now, how are we going to distribute 
these n dimensions among these spaces. Well, here's the thing. Since the dimension has to increase or stay the same as you move to the right, what that's telling us is that, for example, if n is equal to 3, the longest possible sequence that we can have is when the dimension of this thing is 1, dimension of this thing is 1, and dimension of this thing is 1. Or we are going to have a shorter sequence. But anyway, in particular, something to realize here is that by the time you get kernel of phi to the nth power, modded up by kernel of phi to the n minus 1, you are going to have used up all of your dimensions. So what that's in particular telling you is that when we sum up the dimensions of all of these, so starting with kernel of phi to the nth power, modded up by kernel of phi to the n minus 1, we should get n. And that's of course telling us that kernel of phi to the nth power is going to have dimension n. In other words, phi to the nth power is going to be the zero map, which is a fascinating fact that we were taking for granted so far. Now turning our attention back to these spaces, realize that if I pick some non-zero vectors, so let's say non-zero vectors v4 prime from this space, so v4 prime mod the kernel of phi cubed really, and then v3 prime modded up by kernel of phi squared from the space, then v2 prime from here and v1 prime from here, then I claim that these four vectors are actually linearly independent. To see why, let's say we have a linear combination like this once again, and let's consider applying phi cubed to both sides. When we apply phi cubed, the reason I'm doing this is that it's gonna make all of these vectors disappear. So we are going to get a4 phi cubed v4 prime is equal to zero. Now, of course, a v4 prime was a non-zero vector in kernel of phi to the fourth modded up by kernel of phi cubed. So phi cubed v4 prime is going to be non-zero. And that's in particular telling us that a4 is going to be zero. So we know this thing is zero. And now you can apply phi squared to show that a3 is going to be zero, then apply phi to show a2 is zero to conclude that these are in fact linearly independent. And what this is telling us is that if we have a basis for each one of these spaces, so if v1, v2, v3 was a basis for this one, we had some other basis for this one, and so on, when we take all of these bases together, then we are going to still preserve the linear independence, and that's in fact going to be a basis of v. Now let us actually try to apply this. Let's say our n was equal to 6, and let us suppose that up to kernel of phi to the fourth modded up by kernel of phi cubed, the only vector in, in the quotient space was the zero vector. So we didn't really have any basis for any of these spaces, but starting at kernel of phi cubed modded up by kernel of phi squared, let's say we have a basis of v1 mod kernel of phi squared, of course, and let us now take phi v1, and let's suppose that the dimension of the space was actually two, so there is some vector v2 such that this is now a basis. Now let us apply phi to phi v1 comma v2, so we get phi 2 v1 comma phi v2, and we know this is linearly independent. And since we know the dimensions have to add up to 6, we know dimension of kernel of phi should be 3. So we should have one more vector v3, such that this is now a basis of kernel of phi. And now consider the matrix corresponding to phi with respect to phi 2 v1, phi v1 v1, then phi v2 v2, then v3 realize that in this 3x3 three three submatrix, we are going to get that phi to v1 is going to be sent to the zero vector because phi to v1 is in the kernel of phi. And then phi v1 is being sent to, when we apply phi, it's going to be sent to phi to v1. So we know that's going to be of the form 1, 0. And v1, when we apply phi, is going to be sent to phi v1. So that's going to be of the form 0, 1, 0. And of course, the, all the entries here are zeros as well. Now when we consider the 2x2 two two block corresponding to 5v2, v2, we are going to see once again, since 5v2 is in the kernel of phi, we are going to have 0 here, and then v2 is going to be sent to 5v2, so we have 1, 0. And then finally v3, which is in the kernel, just corresponds to 0. Here each one of these blocks is called a Jordan block, and Jordan blocks in fact gives us a deeper meaning into the dimensions of each one of these spaces. For example, the dimension of kernel of phi here was equal to 3, which corresponds to phi to v1, phi v2, and v3. So this 3 is really giving us the number of Jordan blocks. Now, dimension of this space is of course 2. What does 2 represent? Well, 2 corresponds to phi v1 and v2. 
and 5e1 and v2, all the vectors that take two iterations for them to disappear. So we need to apply phi twice for v2 and 5v1 to really disappear. And 5v1 and v2 of course correspond to Jordan blocks that are of size 2x2 two two or larger. So this 2 really represents the number of Jordan blocks of size 2x2 two two or larger. And of course the dimension of the space is 1. And this 1 represents the number of Jordan blocks of size 3x3 three three or larger. And that's of course just 1. And this form, which as you probably expect, is called the Jordan normal form, in which we have these ones right above the main diagonal in each Jordan block. And since these dimensions give us the number of Jordan blocks of any size, we see that the Jordan normal form is going to be unique up to shuffling of these Jordan blocks. So what I mean by that is if we had started this sequence of bases, with 5v2v2, then we followed it with 5v2v1, 5v1v1. So if we started with this thing instead, then certainly these two blocks would have been switched. But the main point is that the number of Jordan blocks of any size is going to be unique. Another way of seeing this is to write these Jordan blocks as partition of n or partition of 6 in this case. So here we really have 6 is equal to 3 plus 2 plus 1, where 3 corresponds to this block, 2 corresponds to this block, and 1 corresponds to this block. So we see that this is exactly the Jordan normal form of phi. Now let us say we have any linear map phi from v to v and throw in the requirement that the field f for the vector space v is algebraically closed. So here let's say lambda 1 all the way to lambda k or the eigenvalues of phi. So these are exactly the eigenvalues. Now let me consider a really gigantic matrix here. And just for the sake of this example, let's say lambda 1 and lambda 2 are our only eigenvalues. Now remember from the previous episode that when we consider kernel of phi minus lambda 1 to the nth power and the kernel of phi minus lambda 2 to the nth power, not only are these spaces linearly independent in the sense that we talked about in the previous episode, their dimensions are going to add up to n. And now realize that due to our previous findings, when we consider phi minus lambda 1, this map is going to get us a Jordan normal form that's going to look something like this. Maybe you have a 0, 0, 0, 1, 1. So let's just take our previous example once again. So and 0, 0, 1, and you have 0. So since phi minus lambda 1 has this Jordan normal form, when we consider just phi, instead of zeros in the diagonal, we are going to have just lambda 1. So we're going to have lambda 1, lambda 1, bunch of lambda 1s. And similarly, we can repeat this for a kernel of phi minus lambda 2 to the nth power and get a matrix that looks something like this. Here I chose the decomposition 4 plus 1. And finally, here it is. This is the Jordan normal form that this episode is about. Now, one thing I want you to realize here is, is that if you consider kernel of phi minus lambda 1 to the nth power and we try applying phi minus lambda to this where lambda is, something in the field, then first of all, as you can show, we are going to get something out in kernel of phi minus lambda 1 to the nth power once again. So this can be our codomain. But not only that, if lambda is not equal to lambda 1, then this map here is going to be an isomorphism. This is not too hard to show and I'll leave it up to you. In particular, if we have a non-zero vector v, so let's say we pick some non-zero vector v from this kernel, and we consider applying v through this map. Now if lambda is not equal to lambda 1, since v is non-zero here, whatever output that we're going to get from this, say v prime, is also going to be non-zero since we have an isomorphism. So question arises, if we want to apply something like phi minus lambda to a non-zero vector in kernel of phi minus lambda 1 to the nth power, and we want this vector v to disappear, then what do we have to do at bare minimum? Well, we first of all cannot pick lambda not equals to lambda 1 because this thing is going to be an isomorphism. So we know we have to apply phi minus lambda 1. But if we just apply this once, that's just enough for these three basis vectors, the basis vectors corresponding to these three entries, to disappear. If we apply it twice, then that's also going to make these entries disappear as well. But if we want to guarantee that every non-zero vector is going to disappear, then we are going to have to pick the size of the largest Jordan block, and we're going to have to pick phi minus lambda 1 cubed to make sure every vector, every vector in the basis is going to disappear. And similarly, at bare minimum, 
for kernel of e minus lambda 2 to the nth power, the size of the largest Jordan block is 4. So we are going to have to apply phi minus lambda 2 to the fourth power to any non-zero vector in kernel of phi minus lambda 2 to the nth power to make it disappear. And hopefully by now you're convinced that this is the smallest possible polynomial that we can have that's going to make any non-zero vector in V disappear when we apply it. In other words, this thing is actually going to evaluate to the zero map. And when we just switch out phi for some variable like lambda, so let's say we write lambda minus lambda one cubed times lambda minus lambda two to the fourth power, this monic polynomial is called the minimal polynomial. And this in particular shows that if A and B are matrices that happen to have the same minimal polynomial, then certainly A and B do not have to be similar. So we see that this implication is not true simply because this same minimal polynomial part is just telling us that A and B have the same largest Jordan block in each one in kernel of phi minus lambda 1 to the nth power and the kernel of phi minus lambda 2 to the nth power and so on. But it doesn't quite capture the sizes of the smaller Jordan blocks. For example, perhaps A has the partition 3 plus 2 plus 1 as we have here, whereas B has partition 3 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. In the case A and B are not going to be similar. In fact, Jordan normal form also gives us some intuition on why A and B having the same characteristic polynomial is not enough for A and B to be similar. Because, for example, for this matrix, when we subtract lambda from the diagonal and we take the determinant, we're going to get the characteristic polynomial of lambda 1 minus lambda 2 to the 6th power times lambda 2 minus lambda 2 to the 5th power. And we see that if A and B happen to have the same characteristic polynomial of this thing, then we have A and B have the same sizes of these two blocks corresponding to the generalized eigenspaces of lambda 1 and lambda 2 respectively, but it doesn't tell us anything about the partition we're getting inside. So we certainly do not have to have similarity here. Fantastic. Okay, now before we say goodbyes to the series, I want to quickly talk about what kind of topics we have not talked about in this series. And the biggest one, without a doubt, is the concept of inner product. And not just inner product, but also bilinear forms, sesquilinear forms. There are tons of material on topics like that that we have not talked about in this series. And this is a huge, huge topic. And if I ever, say, make a second edition to this Navigating Linear Algebra series, this is probably going to take us around five episodes. Of course, there are other topics like tensor product space or matrix decomposition that we have not really talked about. But the main point is that you may want to consider learning about inner products or even just the dot product for you to really finish your study of basic linear algebra. Anyway, thank you so much for your support and your interest in the series. I hope you enjoyed navigating linear algebra.